just not. <laughs> French is a pretty easy one to cover. <laughs> Romanian. Um. Okay, so someone gave me a language, but uh, let me type. Wow. That's interesting. Hello, Daniel. Hello. How's it going? Good. That's good. I got to ask, but is Motti still around? Good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. He is in Berlin. Late, <laughs> lately. Well, he's also we got kids have, now, right? So I get it. Yeah. He's not in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has his second, second child, I guess. That's why yeah. I think he's quite busy. Since yeah. the second child, we ha I haven't heard of him. Yeah. Also with the kinda... job. And I think, yeah, it's, he got busy. But I think we'll yeah. soon hear from him. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. That's like a funny... So, uh, <clears throat> Motti is always a funny thing because uh, in Dutch, Motti is kind of like buddy. Oh, like, okay. like, <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I used to tell like the Pai Data, like Amsterdam people back in the day, like, oh, I'm going to go to Motti. Oh, your buddy. Yeah, I'm in Ber Pai Data Berlin, but not like that, the other way. His, his, his name is Motti. It was always kind of fun. Fun little gimmick there. But. I think I will stop uh, adding people to the Zoom. Everyone else can just watch it on YouTube, I guess. and ask questions there. Any objections? Yeah, Did I'll you... put it on Meetup also, the streaming link. Well, it's already done. Did someone already post it? I cannot. See. I'm doing it, so let's uh, see. Okay. Cool. Da -da. okay. Um, Five past seven, I think we can can start. Uh, let me share the press the record button. Yes. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, PyData Berlin uh, February edition, two thousand twenty-one. Uh, one more time online. Uh, so we have two talks uh, today, uh, but first I would like to remind you uh, about uh, PyData. So we are uh, part of NumFocus and as part of NumFocus, we have a code of conduct, uh, the short version being uh, be nice, do not be respectful of the others um, and everything will be fine. Um, and without further notice, uh, let's go to the first talk by uh, Vincent. Um, so we will talk about his work as Reza and about chatbots. Uh, and uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to write it in the chat. Or if you're on the YouTube, uh, you can also put it in the chat there and we'll forward it uh, to the speaker. Cool. Let me just make sure I've got my chat window open here as well. So that looks good. Uh, also to the crowd, like we can see me doodle, I hope, right? This is something that we can all see. Yes. Yeah. Grand, 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 grand. So <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vincent. I won't be talking about chatbots too much today. Uh, like I'll talk about all sorts of byproducts uh, that we've uh, got now, uh, but I won't be talking too much about chatbots themselves. Um, first of all, uh, hello, my name is Vincent. I'm a research advocate at Raza. Um, so a big part of what I do is uh, I make some YouTube videos to explain like some of the algorithms that we make. And the reason that I uh, you know, do this is because it's my job to sort of interface on one end with our research team. And we're doing you know, kind of advanced numerical tricks to make chatbots work. So there's like complicated stuff here. Uh, and I need to interface with developers as well. And the main thing that I'm trying to do is make sure that some of the things that our research team does is you know, accessible to my lovely group of community developers here, but also the other way around that if 
cool things are happening in you know the community that the research team is also kind of aware of that and this is the ground that i'm trying to cover i do a little bit of research but i'm also a little bit more focused toward the developer advocacy so to say in particular um, you can kind of pick the problem you work on at raza uh, but in particular i'm very interested in doing everything uh, possible to me uh, for non-english use cases i think there's a lot of cool papers and a lot of really cool work on english natural language processing um, but the world is much bigger, right? It's not just English. We need multiple languages supported. Um, and my particular realm of interest is this non-English bit. So some of the things I do at Raza is I open source a couple of tools that are useful to explore this. Um, I also host some Raza compatible tools for uh, non-English developers. But the interesting thing that happened last year, which I didn't really anticipate, is that you know, besides me being Vincent, the guy who works at Raza and the person who's a you know research advocate, um, I'm also like an open source kind of person. I have lots of hobby projects and lots of projects that I maintain and also lots of projects that I contribute to. Um, I, you know, I Fair Learn is a project I've spent some effort on. Um, there's some of these loose scikit-learn compatible packages that I maintain. And I like to think of myself as someone who's actively working for Raza. But while I work for Raza, I also have my own independent work that I'm doing on the side. Um, keep your eyes peeled for a tool that's gonna come out next week, by the way. But if I'm gonna talk about anything today, what I would really like to talk about is how this kind of weird, happy open source accident happened. Um, because what happened a couple of months ago is I was working on my own thing while working on the Raza thing. And it turned out that these two completely different tracks of work were able to merge in a very lovely way. And the reason why I think I want to maybe focus in on that is because, it's because it also gives us a observation on maybe this new mindset that we might be able to do in research, which I, to me at least was kind of a, a neat observation. Um, having said all of this, um, what I'm going to do now for the rest of the talk is live demoing. So I'm going to try to explain what I mean by everything I've just said. So, oh, uh, shortcuts, shortcuts, shortcuts. There we go. Um, I'm hoping this is, can people read this? This is like good size, font wise. Okay, cool. Uh, I think it was about five months ago, I started this open source project called Human Learn. And uh, it's kind of like scikit-learn, but the idea is instead of algorithms trying to find patterns, it'd be kind of nice if we had a way to have humans come up with decent rules instead. I think there's a lot of really good domain knowledge and I would like to have domain knowledge be more scikit-learn compatible. Um, kind of, you know, a little bit of a project that goes against the hype. But the main idea I really wanna do is I wanna make it easier for people to write rules that can take in data and produce labels. Because I think there's a lot of human intelligence, natural intelligence that we can do here instead of just always focusing on the artificial kind. And there's a bunch of features in this library that is really, really lovely. But here's my favorite one. Let's say that this is a data set that you're interested in classifying. Right? So um, you've got your red dots, you've got your green dots, you've got your blue dots. We've got an enterprise use case. We want to you know, do the classification thing. That's the thing we're interested in. Then what you could do is you could say, well, let's do this complicated algorithm thing. And that, that's this geometric trick that's going to separate all of these classes. But I hope that you recognize just from you know, looking at this particular data set, you don't need any like TensorFlow or anything like that here. You just kind of want to draw a circle around the class and just say, you know, if, if a new point falls within this shape, then I'll just call that red. So one of the main features that this library allows you to do is it allows you to do exactly this. You can just draw a shape. Oh, I need to use the actual mouse for this, my bad. It's not great for everything. But what this library basically allows you to do is you can just sort of draw a shape and say, okay, that's the red class. Here's the blue one. Here's the green one. And if we ever get like a new data point in, then we can kind of do this point in poly algorithm thing where, you know, if a point falls here, it's probably green. And if there's a point over here, well, then it's probably an outlier. Like we can do very simple stuff like this, really, if you think about it. The, the data is already there. And I could do this on multiple axes, right? So I, 
Uh, I can do this with two dimensions, but I can do this with n dimensions, but just making more of these separate charts and you can keep drawing. But what I thought was pretty neat is just sort of the whole design aspect of this. Um, what I just did is I, all the data that I just drew is inside of this variable over here. And I'm putting that inside of this interactive classifier, which is basically saying, take what I drew over here and turn it into something that scikit-learn can handle that you can also grid search over if you really wanted to. Uh, and just as a proof of concept, you can see that, you know, what I just drew are also the predictions that we're making here. But the main thing that I liked about this view is just the whole point of when you're exploring a data set the first time, you don't want to do the XG boost thing. You actually want to sort of actually go and explore a data set. And by doing this trick first, if only as a benchmark, you have this nice little aspect that you're forced to actually look at your data and think about it. And that was kind of the point I wanted to make with this library, just a sort of idea of, you know, you don't always need complex algorithms. You can also maybe get some domain knowledge in and, and have like a benchmark model based on that. So if that works pretty well, you know, then maybe you don't need TensorFlow. That was sort of the, the vantage point that I had. Now, what I'm showing you here, this is something I made on my own. It's just something I figured would be a cool thing to do. And the nice thing about, you know, living on GitHub sometimes is that people can collaborate and there's some really interesting projects out there. I'm not doing anything super serious with this, but I but I have heard people like use this in production, which is pretty neat. But this was something I was doing uh, on my own end. While I was doing this though, I started. I also started working at Raza. And at Raza, we noticed that we kind of had this one sort of interesting issue. And that was that on one end, we wanted to make sure that people who were using Raza kind of understood word embeddings and also what's in them. And on the other side, we also figured, well, it'd be kind of nice if we had this really like just useful quick API that allows us to just evaluate a bunch of embeddings real quick. We kind of need this library that tells us what lies in word embeddings. And that's how the ball got rolling on this project that's hosted on Raza. It's independent of Raza. You can just uh, download it independently. But the idea of this package is called what lies because we want to use it to figure out what lies in word embeddings. The way it works is you can say, well, there's a backend. In this case, I'm saying, well, let's take some byte pair embeddings. Uh, those are a particular kind of word embedding that's robust against spelling mistakes. And then I have this language object. And what I can do is I can kind of like Panda style, just say, look, if, if this is a dictionary of sorts of all sorts of word embeddings, I just wanna put all of my words in there and then get sort of a data frame out that represents like a collection of vectors like names with arrays, so to say. So one thing that, that just for uh, demonstration purposes, if I take that by pair language and I give it the word man, uh, then I get this embedding object and inside of that is this, uh, this vector, so to say. So this is just a retrieval method to get like vectors out. But the cool thing about having that in like a data frame kind of setting instead is that you can more easily add plotting functionality on top of that. So one thing that I can do is I can say, could you just plot the similarity between all the words that are in here? Let's use cosine distance for that. Uh, oh, metric. And what's kind of nice and funny and interesting and cool is that you can sort of see, well, there's a couple of word clusters uh, happening inside of here. And, and this gives us like a very convenient way to maybe explore that because I can also tweak the settings here a bit. I can say, well, I would like to have like a larger vocabulary size or a smaller one. There's all sorts of settings that I can tweak here, but I have this nifty little plotting functionality that's available to me. Now, what's nice about this is that byte pair embeddings are just one kind of embedding, but there's also other types of embeddings. You can make embeddings based off of scikit-learn. You can make a TF-IDF vector embedding. You can get embeddings from Hugging Face. You can get them from TensorFlow. But what Lies tries to do is, what Lies basically says, well, we make sure that you just have to talk to like one single API and one single API only. And we do our best to make sure that we uh, cover as much ground as far as support goes. So that means that we actually have a couple of backends that we support out of the box. So Jensen, we do uh, some of the scikit learn tricks. We do fast text, sentence birth, Hugging Face, Spacey, TensorFlow Hub, like these are all natively supported. So if you have any embedding from those, uh, then you can just use our library to do visual stuff, basically. 
but it's not just visual stuff that we do um, because all of our language embeddings are also scikit-learn compatible. So um, I'm assuming I'm talking to a crowd who's done scikit-learn before. Um, so if you have like your data set in this XY format and you would like to make a prediction, then you can use any language model that this library provides and it will behave like a transformer, like a standard scalar, so to say. Uh, all of these language models that you have here are models where text goes in on one side of the, uh, the component. Let's just draw that out. And on the other side, you get basically uh, a vector uh, that belongs to that text. And it doesn't matter if you're using Hugging Face, you can always use this API. So if you just want to do some quick benchmarks on whatever language you're interested in, uh, you can totally do that here. And there's one thing that's actually particularly cool about this byte pair language setting, because the byte pair embeddings itself, we can kind of just uh, maybe just show you the website real quick, BPM. It's a, it's a project that there's a couple of numeric tricks that are happening inside of this library too that are really awesome. But uh, the main thing that's really epic about this project in particular is that it supports um, 275 languages. So even if you're working in non-English, um, odds are that there is a pre-trained language embedding for you that you can go ahead and play with. Um, so just to give a, a quick demo, what I'm just going to go ahead and do is just uh, type in a, the word embedding languages that people were asking for in the chat. So I think Romanian was one of them, but Romanian is definitely supported. So what I can do is I can sort of take this language code over here and just um, put that inside of scikit-learn and sort of play around with it. Um, this is the only change you need to do to have a language embedding for Romanian. And when you run this, uh, the first time it will sort of download all of these things, but once it's done downloading, you're, you're good to go. So just as a demo, right? Cause I think it'd be kind of cool to show. Um, what I've got here is Greek. So just some Greek words. And I, I took the words that I had before to Google Translate. Uh, and you can see that, you know, we, we get the same similarity chart out, which is definitely uh, kind of nice. Um, and this is nice because you can also then make the comparison of, hey, are uh, the same kind of word embedding trained on English Wikipedia, uh, do the embeddings represent something differently than if I do that for Turkish or whatever other language. But uh, I also support languages like uh, Telugu uh, indirectly. However, if you use those languages, you get into this interesting other uh, dimension of support for language. Um, because I support, like the, the vectors just come out, so that's completely fine. But the issue with some languages in matplotlib is that matplotlib cannot always handle the characters, which is also this sort of small little bummer. Um, so luckily, one thing that we can do nowadays on the web is we could say, well, instead of relying on matplotlib, it would be nice if we can have like a rendering engine that's kind of guaranteed to be able to handle most language typesets. So what we also offer are uh, visualizations that are based on the, oh, whoops, I need to re that, sorry. I thought I ran this. There we go. But what we can do is we can say, well, I'm interested in making this plot, but I want to plot it directly on a web interface. So that's what you see here. Because you know, a browser is actually meant to be able to render just about anything, uh, you'll find that there's a lot better language support if you just have an interactive visualization that can just you know, draw on the canvas, so to say. So one of the things that we also support is we also support this idea of you know, take the word embeddings. This is a data frame with embeddings, so to say. And we can say, well, let's transform that by doing a principal components analysis. And let's then make these Altair charts. So you can have like, you know, these interactive visualizations on the PCA dimensions. Let's zoom out once more so you can kind of see it. And what's kind of cool here is, you know, you can kind of explore where some of the clusters are. And if you're working in the multi-language setting, you would really like to confirm that certain clusters that you expect are actually in here before you put it into a classifier. So, you know, this, I, I, I figured this is pretty useful. This is pretty interesting, right? Like we have scikit-learn compatibility, we have hugging face and all these language backends. That's, that's pretty cool. But 
here's where the happy accident happened. Um, I, I have these views, right? So I can definitely see like, hey, there's a cluster over here. But at the same time, I was also looking at this chart and sort of going, you know what? What's really nice about this is that I can just draw a circle around like a couple of points and sort of assign a label to that using this trick that I've got here inside of human learn. That idea is pretty nice. And if I now start looking at what I've got here and you know what is actually going to be useful to like some of my Raza end users who I'm trying to help with non-English, well, then I might need to take a step back and wonder, maybe we shouldn't use these embeddings just for classification. Maybe that's not necessarily the big problem. You see, a lot of these embeddings in the end, they're trained on something like Wikipedia. And if you think about what Wikipedia represents, that's, you know, uh, amazing spelling, super formal, probably about something in history. But if you think about how language is used online and like in a more, you know, assistant setting, It'll be like full of spelling errors, super informal, and something that's happening right now as opposed to something that happened a long time ago. So maybe, you know, these embeddings are like pretty interesting and all, but maybe it's not just for making classifications that they're interesting. Maybe instead we should use them for labeling. Because you notice that there is this clustering happening here, right? And you can imagine that if you're starting out with a new assistant in a non-English setting, the probably the first problem that you have isn't do I have embeddings, but it's do I have appropriate training data in the first place? If you're working on an assistant and let's say you're a business, then the likely scenario is that you do have, let's say, some social media data of like customers asking frequently asked questions or like, you know, you have these logs of conversations that you already had. And it might be a better idea to wonder like, can we take that data and maybe more quickly label that real quick? to get like a gold label standard going as quickly as possible, as opposed to like only taking a few data sets with like a few labels and using word embeddings to optimize uh, there. So that got me thinking like, hey, maybe I need to combine the human learn idea with this what lies thing that got going. Um, so that's what I've done here. Now I'm about to show you a demo, but just to give you an impression of what's happening, right? The way that this, this is a notebook and it's kind of a project on its own that's open source, everyone can download it. But the way that this works is I assume that you have text that we would like to label. I then pass that through a language model and that can be anything. It can be something based on TensorFlow, Hugging Face or whatever. I then end up with a embedding of sorts. And then what I can then do is a dimensionality reduction technique that lures the clusters out to then give me a two-dimensional view and then probably what I can do is in this two-dimensional view, I can do the trick where I do the selection. And maybe this is a very convenient way for me to do like bulk labeling. I won't be getting gold labels, but I will be getting like maybe bronze or silver ones. And the, the idea here isn't so much that I get like the best labels right away, but it is the idea that I am able to plow through lots of data relatively quickly. So what I've got here, is a training file from a Raza bot. Um, I've passed that through the universal sentence encoder. Um, that went through UMAP. And what you end up with is plotted here. And what I'm able to do is just make a selection of a particular cluster. And I can say, well, let's, let's show the examples of that cluster. And one of the like, really convenient things these days at the Jupyter Lab is that these widgets just kind of work. So you can just make your own user interface happen real quick here. And you know, there's, there's actually like a whole bunch of points here. I can actually probably just maybe uh, zoom in just a little bit here. But there's like a lot of points over on this end. So instead of like assuming that these are all the rows, I can hit the show examples like a couple of times to get an impression of what's happening there. But at the moment I do think like, hey, this is all about like restaurants and food. So let's just say this is about like food. Uh, I think that's a good label for like all the points that I have there. So that's 55 data points. That's nice. Uh, let's maybe uh, pick up that view and move that down here and see what is over there. Okay, that's all about age. All right, fair enough. So uh, let's add all of those labels. Uh, maybe do over here. Let's have a look there. Show examples. Okay, that's all about jokes. Joke, add label. 
Now, I did a couple of clusters just now, and I don't really need to see them anymore. So what I can also just do now is just hit redraw. Basically, it just draws all the points that aren't labeled yet. So I can repeat this exercise now. Let's just zoom in on this. Uh, yeah, let's do a cluster over here. All right, let's just show the examples again. Uh, okay, this is what, what's the time, All right? That's also a good cluster over there. Uh, let's maybe do this one, show examples. Okay, that's uh, nice to meet. Okay, so I got a couple of labels now, that's pretty good. But now that I think of it, if I sort of redraw now, I, I do have a couple of these clusters that are just a little bit more clumped together. They're a little bit closer and I might wanna sort of pull them apart again. So what you can do, is you can say, well, let's not retrain this whole language embedding. But what we could do is say, well, let's keep using the same embeddings we had here, but let's just retrain UMAP. And, and that way we might also still be able to pull apart some of these clusters to make it more easily to sort of bulk label. And that's what this retrain button does. It takes a little while, but after a bit, all the UI elements are back. And we see that like the chart has reoriented a little bit, the clusters have moved and et cetera. And you know, uh, I could basically repeat the same exercise. Oh. Draw the shape over here, show examples. Yeah. About the weather. What you do see is if you move over a cluster here, I mean, it's not necessarily a guarantee that things will cluster apart this nicely in real life. I'm, do I'm using a training data set here, which is giving it a bit of a biased perspective. But in reality, one thing that you can imagine is that you might need to actually zoom in a bit here so here, like, what's the time? Who is your boss? What company created you? There's, you can imagine there's a couple of classes actually sort of hidden in here. So it's not like you can have like a free lunch. Like you still probably have to sort of go in here and, and do like deep investigation. But as a way to get started, if I think about it, maybe this is a really good idea. What we're looking for are ways for people to get to their gold standard data set as quickly as possible. And given that I have on one end, a pretty cool user interface that can deal with this part. And on the other end, I have this library full of embeddings that are just ready to go pre-trained in whatever backend you like. I think we can cover kind of a lot of ground here. So this idea of maybe doing more bulk labeling as a method of getting people, uh, you know, their bootstrap together. I mean, there is merit to that idea, I think. So this is, my active research area at the moment. And um, the thing with this is, uh, just to show, you can nicely export this. You get all of your labels in a nice data frame. So the thing is, I can try this out on a bunch of data sets, and that's pretty cool. It's pretty nice. But what I cannot do is run this in every language out there and confirm that this is actually working. Uh, for that, I kind of need this community around me to tell me, like, hey, Vincent, that trick works well for this language, and this trick works well for another language. So what my job at Raza currently kind of is, is I, I support the research team in explaining what our algorithms are. But a big other part of my job is to make sort of these byproducts like this and to see if this is useful to like the larger community out there. In order to verify that though, I need um, to speak at meetups and like kindly ask everyone here um, if this trick works. Um, so if uh, you want to give this a go, like I'll share the links and everything. Uh, all of this stuff is open source, so you can just uh, goof around whatever you feel like. Um, but I would love to learn if this is something that helps you get started with a training data set in the first place. Because um, that's something I would love to get feedback on. And that is something that I cannot benchmark on my own. I actually need community feedback for this. Um, so um, that's the main thing I actually just uh, wanted to say. Um, in general, um, my job really is to make tools available. Uh, I literally get paid to make tools such that natural language processing is easier across the board, particularly for Raza, of course, but uh, I have plenty of byproducts there. Um, but I cannot benchmark data uh, for you. Uh, I need to hear from you. So please tell me what does and what doesn't work. Um, and in particular, the, another reason why I think this area of more research is interesting is, you know, <clears throat> in data science, we very often have this stuff that we optimize. You know, that's where we could where we do the grid search, where we try the bird thing, and we really hit the power pedal to sort of uh, flow all the tensors, et cetera. But there's also this area where 
um, maybe we shouldn't really optimize too much unless we really understand what our users care about. It's like a problem that happens in machine learning a lot where we know that we're optimizing something, but we aren't necessarily sure if this overlap here is, is that big. So on my end, um, I would love to, I, I, I would love to optimize more, but uh, I would love it even more if people can tell me which tools are more useful than others. And I'll gladly uh, contribute to projects that help you in that regard, especially if you're doing non-English NLP. That's it. Um, I, there are two questions uh, as far as I can see in, in the chat and I have a question as well. And the first question would be, have you considered, I mean, you showed only the two dimensional representation because that's the only one that you can really highlight and uh, draw. Sort of, yeah, yeah, you can draw only two dimensionally, uh, but is there some type of tool that you've maybe thought about where you can just, first of all, switch through all of the dimensions that you have in your embedding yeah. space such that you could just basically in each projection, you just sort of highlight it. And if it's just a different projection and there is no cluster to the label that you actually wanted. Uh, so there's you... two, two things there. So first thing is um, I kind of showed up with this example. I'll just make that big again. But in this example, like um, I have two charts here. One is bill length uh, versus bill depth. Mm -hmm. And the other chart is flipper length versus body mass. So technically two charts are four dimensions. So that's already an avenue that you can kind of do. A thing I would love to have in human learn, but it's like good grief, a whole lot of front end stuff I got to do. There is this project called High Plot. Um, it's from Facebook. And it's these, and the idea behind this is you get these uh, parallel coordinates where you can sort of, uh, everything you see here is like its own um, dimension. And you can make a subselection on just one dimension at a time. And what I would love to be able to do is have like a word embedding where I say, well, let's reduce down the 10 dimensions and still keep most of the variance. And then say, oh, like, hey, there seems to be, oh, like I want to get the high value here and I want to get the red and okay, this, this might be a cluster, give that a label. And notice that when I move this around, like the, the table at the bottom here also updates. So I think as far as UI goes, I think this is something I would love to have but I really need to do the front end bit. And that is gonna take like a lot, a lot of work because uh, this high plot thing is pretty cool, but right now they don't support you removing the high plot logo and they don't, it's not really an open API either. So that's the, uh, the main thing I'm battling with. But that, that's, that's what I would love to take this uh, labeling thing to next. Okay, cool. So uh, a question that was asked in the uh, chat, but it was more of a technical nature when you go down to the actual implementation of this last uh, labeling. Uh, this thing? GUI. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think one of the questions was, have you used PCA? Is there a clustering example? Because I mean, I, I guess the question is geared towards um, to get these nice clusters, you first have to implement some type of idea um, how this cluster will actually manifest itself, right? Well, so it's, it, the thing is, it, I would argue it doesn't depend on, there's a couple of axes there. So yes, you can use PCA here as well. It's just my experience, UMAP is just badass. It just always kind of works. It's, I don't know what the secret sauce is. It just always kind of works. So I'm pretty happy with UMAP. I wouldn't really change that. Now, as far as this language thing goes here, I mean, you've got BERT you can use here as well. If you've got like sentences, you want to do the more contextual thing. Uh, I'm using the universal sentence encoder here, which works pretty well for English. It's pretty fast. But the thing with the language embeddings, in the end, they are trained on Wikipedia-like data sets. So if you're applying this on, let's say, Twitter data, I mean, Twitter is going to be significantly different. So then, you know, these super apparent clusters are just not going to be there, I think. Um, but then if that's the case, I mean, this is more of a matter of, well, it depends on the data that you have. Like if you have Twitter data that's all about people complaining, you're basically going to see like one fat cluster in it. Uh, but if you have like a little bit of Twitter data that's super positive and some Twitter data that's super negative, yeah, then you're gonna more obviously get clusters. But this is more of a data thing than a choice of embedding, um, in my experience at least. Okay, uh, and another question that was just posted by uh, somebody from Austin, Texas. Uh, he asks if there's a GitHub repo. If you can um, mention it again. Yeah, so there's not a GitHub repo for this presentation per se, but like everything that I'm showing here is super open source. So if you type what lies Raza, 
Um, you'll get to this uh, GitHub repository. It's fully documented. I'm pretty happy with the layout. Um, if you're interested in the bulk labeling demo, uh, if you type bulk labeling Raza, you'll actually find like two YouTube videos that explain the technique more in depth. And especially this video, um, like it just has all the links to the notebooks that you can just pretty much copy and paste. Um, um, so like, again, everything I'm showing here is open source and also all the embeddings that I showed earlier, uh, they're also available in Raza. So if you're interested in making a Raza assistant and you're wondering, hey, do I have these embeddings? Um, I'm trying to make them available. Um, if there's tools missing, let me know on Twitter. I'd love to hear. So uh, there is actually a question regarding um, weekly supervised tools like Snorkel, if there's some type of compatibility or if there, if you have any experience or thoughts on how this might work in combination with it? Yeah, so um, so when I made Human Learn, uh, I, I wasn't integrating with Snorkel, I was integrating with Scikit-Learn. And it's my understanding that Snorkel does the same thing. Like Snorkel won't integrate with my hobby projects, so that's fine. Uh, Snorkel integrates with Scikit-Learn. So far, so good. I will say like, I think I have a slightly different approach though, because um, let's just go to the documentation page for Human Learn to show real quick. So inside of human learn, we've also got these uh, function classifiers. So the idea is you can say, hey, here's a function. It's like a weak classifier and you can pass it any Python function. The keyword arguments become grid searchable. Like that's, that's some of the stuff that we have here. What this library doesn't do though, which I think Snorkel does do, like Snorkel has this thing of, well, we have all these weak supervisors and then we combine them in a magic way and then the prediction's better. I've never really understood what the magic thing is that they exactly do. So that's the one thing that my library doesn't. It's, it, it's just some scikit-learn components, really. I believe that there are some clever things that Snorkel does there, but um, I, I'm really, really doing like the stupidly simple thing here. That's the what I'm trying to go for. OK, I think uh, there aren't any more questions in the, in the chat. So um, that would be it from me. If there, does anyone else have any questions? I have one person asking me for uh, if we have Limburg, Limburg's uh, word embeddings. Oh. Um, I, and the thing, I think we do have them. Uh, I also think we have Fisch, to be honest. I think there's a couple of dialects in here. Limburgen, no. oh, I think that's the oh. one. Yep. Now, it should be said though, like uh, there's definitely like a lot of things in here, but I think it's also still safe to say it's fairly European centric, this, this particular library. Uh, because everything that this library does is trained on Wikipedia. So if your language doesn't have like a reasonably big Wikipedia section, then there's no embeddings trained for you. So I don't want to suggest that this is like a, you know, homogeneously distributed language embedding package uh, looking at the world. Uh, but there's definitely a lot in here, which is kind of nice. The only thing I do want to maybe mention is that Wikipedia data isn't perfect. I don't know if people heard what happened with Scottish Gaelic. Uh, the story here was, I believe it was like an American 16 year old um, who basically thought, oh, you know, it'd be funny if I just at upload like Wikipedia articles with words that sound Scottish and no one really checked that. And apparently like a big chunk of the, the, the Scottish Wikipedia, I believe was uploaded by a 16 year old. And therefore all the word embeddings that were trained on that uh, can't be super relied upon, which is probably happening with this uh, embedding as well. Uh, but uh, Irish Gaelic is also an interesting one. Someone just asked. Yeah, so Irish, I guess, is in here. Well, it's also pretty cool. If you go to the documentation of this project, by the way, you can um, you can basically say the vocabulary size and how many dimensions. And then you can just get the bokeh visualization. So you can also just zoom in uh, and get like an impression of all the words that are in here on the subword. So that's also something that you can do uh, on your own time if you're interested in exploring this further. So two. There's a couple of questions about how you uh, export the data, but uh, it's, it's indeed just a pandas data frame. Uh, that's it. So you can save it in whatever format you like. If you scroll to the bottom uh, here, you'll notice the uh, that I end up with this. 
oh, data frame, basically. I'm, I'm interested in maybe turning this into a package. It's just that I would prefer to have a little bit more feedback from the community before I do something uh, more formal with it. Great. Uh, what's the best way to communicate with you? Via issues on some type of GitHub or? <laughs> on some type of GitHub. Uh, I also have a GitLab account, but I think it would be better if people post issues on the right repo. Um, now, so uh, if you go to Twitter, uh, if you find the guy in the ball pit, that's me. Uh, so if you type Vincent PyData, you'll probably find me, but uh, fishnets88 is my alias. Um, if you look for Raza or like Vincent Raza on LinkedIn, you'll also find me. Um, if it's related to my projects, I certainly do prefer GitHub. But if you talk to me on LinkedIn, I will talk back. If you talk to me on Twitter, I will talk back. Um, any feedback is appreciated. Great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, we don't. Uh, okay. Just see, there was a last question. Uh, can you add in the Bokeh app we the add text into the new text and enter it in the label that already exists? It's it's all happening inside of a Jupyter notebook, so no one is telling you not to do things. Uh, you will might maybe need to code it up yourself though, if you want to add that feature. But if uh, if you can do it with Python code, you can do it inside of Jupyter notebook, so it, it should be possible. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. It was thank very you. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so now the second presentation uh, will be by uh, actually Jean and uh, myself uh, of uh, some of the work that we did at Get Your Guide. Uh, so let me start setting things up. Theo, do you want to take a break or you want to, to start it right away? Or I will. I will just let me setting up and like we can okay. uh, just have like a five minute chat. Um, okay. Yeah. Like, so people, uh, let's say we continue at uh, ten to eight. Okay. So we have like five minutes breaks between the. Yeah. Sure. Two. So you can grab a coffee, grab a tea, say hi to the cat. And I also to want to say to, for the ones uh, who are here, uh, we'll also have try to have um, a more meetup field uh, after the second presentation where we'll go to Wanda. So Wanda is a, uh, a nice platform uh, that we use uh, once uh, once in our company and it looks very promising. But well, basically you are kind of in a 2D map where, where you have a a point and when you move around and meet other people you will start to be able to interact with them and so we'll share the link at the end and maybe we can have some more informal conversation when if you want to ask a question to some people or maybe just create group so basically to to try to have more of this uh, informal knowledge sharing and uh, exchange between members It's the first try uh, with this uh, platform, so please uh, share feedback with us afterwards. I'll be very interested to see. Afterwards, or we can find it tomorrow. Uh, I will share it in the in the chat, and I will also also post it in uh, the PyData uh, page uh, on Meetup.
Theo. Uh, do you have a special name for your machine learning platform? Or is it? Uh, good question. Damn. <laughs> machine learning puns. Machine learning puns. Quick, someone. <laughs> We we are open to yes. suggestions, so please do not hesitate to. Uh, Florence and the machine learning. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes AI, uh, AI people, Caramba. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people have their own name for their platforms. You know, like Davis AI, or so. Yeah, you can have TJI AI or TJML. <laughs> Like I, I, when I was younger, I figured it'd be kind of funny to have like a company named Intelligence Inc. And then the title under it would be We Make Sense. Um, but then this whole hype thing started and I kind of went, nah, it's just a really bad idea. Let's not even go there. I think it's actually a company name, I guess. It probably is. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me too much. Intelligence Inc. I heard uh, page rank has a very special meaning, can you guess? Um, can you, I'll, I'll gladly Page. hear any recommendations you might have. Larry Page, I don't know. Exactly, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the homework I, I heard. Maybe you can do that. What does the what does the frequentist say to the Bayesian? Your well, average. Okay, we try it again. What does the frequentist say to the Bayesian? Your average. What does the Bayesian say to the frequentist? Your mean. Oh, Your mean. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's. <laughs> okay. It... 10 to 8, so I propose to start. So welcome uh, for the second part. Um, so Jean, uh, Jean and I will be presenting uh, the foundation of our ML platform, uh, Get Your Guide. Uh, so my name is Theodore and I'm French, uh, working at Get Your Guide since August 2021 as a data scientist uh, in the recommendation and relevance team. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jean Carlos Machado. I'm from Brazil. I'm in Europe now for three years uh, working at Get Your Guide and there uh, as an engineer facing uh, solving problems around recommendations, search and ranking basically. So in the next 25 minutes, uh, we'll present or we lay the foundation of our ML platform at Get Your Guide. So to make, to make it easier for our data scientists to iterate through the cycle of first ID, then coding, then experiment. So if you have any question, please uh, write it down in the chat and we will answer them at the end. Okay, great. Uh, so this is our agenda for this presentation. So first, Jean will start with an introduction about Get Your Guide. Then we will dive uh, into the use cases that we have in data science in our company. And Jean will also present uh, how we iterated on the deployment of our models and their limitations. Next, we will have, uh, we'll present the foundation of our platform. Uh, in the first part, we'll explain how we, how we leverage MLflow, MLflow sorry, to manage uh, our models. And then in second part, Jean will explain how we use the templating to bootstrap our project with the good practices. And we'll conclude with some final words and open for questions. Yes, yeah, so uh, to talk about our machine learning platform uh, in Get Your Guide, first we have to uh, introduce Get Your Guide, I guess, for uh, European ideas like this. Uh, it's, you probably know uh, the company, but in case you don't know, so Get Your Guide is building one of the biggest marketplaces for travel experiences. Uh, we are connecting millions of customers over our catalog of more than 40,000 experiences worldwide. Uh, to summarize our mission is to give access to the world for incredible experiences and to get more concrete about what that means is uh, so 
if you want, for instance, to skydive on the Sugarloaf in Rio, or uh, you want to see the sunset of New York City from the top of uh, the Empire State Building, or explore food markets on Hong Kong, Get Your Guide is a place to, uh, to find this kind of activities and it's just some few clicks away of you. Um, as you might guess, the travel sector was pretty much hit by the, the pandemic. Uh, so we took this time as an opportunity to uh, invest heavily on our tech foundations, um, yeah, to be ready for the market rebound. Uh, and the machine learning platform is part of this investment. So uh, back to me. So now that you have a kind of a, an idea of what the company is doing, I will tell you a little more about how we are using ML at Get Your Guide. So actually our data science team started five years ago. And uh, in during this time until today, the amount of projects that we own grew. And so we use machine learning to, in different areas. So for example, we use them to, uh, to rank the activities we propose to, uh, to show on the top the most relevant from our inventory. And we show them on the different learning pages and also on the search res uh, result pages. And see, you can have an example here. You can also just uh, Google get your guide and we'll find uh, also our, uh, the, the website. Uh, we also uh, use machine learning to recommend personalized activities to our customers uh, with uh, panels that we distribute also on the, on the website and on the app. Um, we also uh, use machine learning to help the tourists to discover destination and find the best activities on Get Your Guide uh, uh, with paid search, uh, the most famous one with Google. And also, we also use ML for demand forecasting to predict, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to predict what will be the demand of so our pre-buy tickets and also simply for our planning. Uh, we also use ML for uh, automatically labeling our inventory of activities. So in total, we have uh, currently more than 20 projects that we need to currently maintain. Uh, and which is distributed among two teams. And we also have uh, some models that uh, are in other teams and we also need to some, from time to time uh, maintain. And so as you can see, we start to reach a critical size. And uh, so for that, to try to stay aligned between the different teams and the different uh, uh, project, we agree on a set of principles that we all follow. Uh, and we can have split them in kind of six pillars. So the first one will be about the strategy. So how do we prioritize the work? And so for example, we favor business value of a state of the art models. Um, the workflow, uh, how do we plan our work? So we, uh, we incorporate the data to inform our planning uh, dynamically. The third one will be about the model, how we build our model. So we value small iteration of existing model. And finally, also the performance is only proven online with A-B test, which is very important for us. Uh, then the fourth one is about QA. Uh, how do we assure the quality of model? So if we are building, we, we want to build solid and resilient deployment. Uh, then uh, we have the injuring principle. Uh, how do we build, basically how do we build our infrastructure? And we want to make sure that our work is reproducible and also modular. And finally, the stakeholder engagement, how do we engage with our partner? And we want to promote and educate our partners across the company about the data product mindset. So in a retrospective, uh, we show that for two of those, uh, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, two, uh, for two of these dimension, especially uh, the, so the QA and the injuring, we uh, were not up standard. Um, so if you are building a model, maybe just for research and you are the only one using it, uh, it might not be a big deal if you have a broken model or for some days. But for us, it's quite critical because if one of our model is down, then it will affect the website and ultimately our customers. And that means we are losing potential revenue and 
this can go really quick, fast. So in the magnitude of thousands of euros for every hour our models are done. So we uh, agree that we need to improve this dimension and this is what this uh, uh, platform is about. Um, so now Jean will explain a bit more about uh, a different approach that we have to develop and deploy our models. So as you said, we've been doing machine learning for around now five years and uh, until 2019 around, we've been using this approach of notebooks first uh, and to go to production. And basically uh, notebooks are great, we indispensable for us. They are widely used by ML practitioners. They have a, a very low uh, entry uh, point for people. You don't have to install a system in your machine to start doing machine learning, you can just open a tab in your browser. They are great to uh, start new projects, prototype ideas, and also they have amazing visualization for non-tech people. Uh, so they are great and very necessary for doing data science, but uh, they have also some uh, features that are not very suitable for going to production. For instance, you can, uh, most notebook solutions, you don't have uh, proper version control. It's also not the best platform to do reuse. Um, and also it's not a, the right place to do tests. You don't have uh, uh, yeah, the infrastructure in place to do that. Notebooks then uh, are very easy to break in summary. Uh, what, if you are going to production with a notebook running your system, and you open that notebook and accidentally type something. I'm very good at typing stuff wrong in notebook cells. And that's very easy to break your, your system. Uh, and in our case, break your systems really means like stop ranking relevant products for when the user searches or not show, or showing noise in our recommendations or even like paying a lot of money to Google to bet in the wrong ads. So there's clear side effects that uh, for us are uh, not uh, make it a not good decision to go in that direction. So, and also they are, uh, so they actually go into production with notebooks is not uh, aligned with our principles. We cannot also build increments of code and maintain it for a long term, like with uh, teams maintaining it rather than individuals. As Theo said, if you are just one person working on a research, the constraints are very different. So to be truthful to our principles, we saw that we needed an improvement. Um, next slide, please. So the second approach uh, we took uh, towards improving this uh, system was, this was made like from 2019, 2020. Um, we ported our code to GitHub and uh, that, that then removing the uh, the necessity to uh, run notebooks in production. Uh, the, the workflow looks more or less like this. You have some working piece of code in a notebook, then you port it to a library. Uh, but still then there is a question on how you deploy it. And we opted for the simplest at first to be incremental. So um, we build it as a, li a Python library and basically do a manual deploy to a S3 bucket that can run standing in our in production infrastructure. Um, yes, but this approach also has its limitations. Uh, when you start from a GitHub empty project, you have like a zero uh, out of the box automation uh, for your quali the quality aspects of your project. Uh, so, and um, that makes also means that, that the different projects will have different ways of uh, automating and they will look very different. People will find different diversion solutions. It's hard to onboard people in such a different set of uh, engineering practices. Uh, so given that everything also starts from the zero ground, we most of the solutions ended up doing manual deployment and also manual deployment for the bucket. Uh, you can see how that can break very, can break very fast. Uh, just by doing enough times a manual deployment, you gotta break it eventually. Uh, and uh, it was not only once that happened, we uh, were building a testing model and uh, somehow wrote in the production uh, location. So you broke 
the system this way. Um, yeah, that's two dimensions or problems with this approach. The third is that we don't have to actually tracking. We are also of our parameters. We are in the dark for in, in the to know uh, which parameters uh, the data scientists use to tune the model, all the learnings that happen uh, that led to the model to be what it is. You, if you don't have that track it, if other people jo joining your project might have to relearn these things. And uh, uh, yeah, that just makes it much more expensive and hard to collaborate. So all, all these uh, problems led us to, to the need of think, uh, to the conclusion that we need to think on machine learning more holistically in our part, thus uh, the need of a machine learning platform. Next. Yeah. And so now I will present uh, more about the platform and so what we built so far. Uh, so we'll break it down in two, in two parts. So first I will talk a bit more about how we make sure that, uh, our, uh, that we are making machine learning reproducible. And so for that, um, we can say that actually if in machine learning, if you just have the code, usually you cannot go that far. Uh, you can, it's bad. But if you have the code and the data, it's already better because at least you can try to, to reproduce. But what you expect is have the code, the data, and also the executable. So with that, you are kind of understand uh, what are the libraries that are needed, the version of them. And so this is a good way to make it reproducible. Finally, what you, what you should have as a gold standard and what we should aim for is to have the code, the data, the executable, uh, and also the logs. Uh, so with that, you are able to iterate faster because if something is broken between two iteration, uh, then you just need to compare the compare the the the, the, the version uh, be, uh, between the two to be able to fix it quickly. Uh, the handover are faster also because you have everything that you need to understand what happened previously, uh, and also if you want uh, for the scientific method approach, this is the right way to improve our model to be able to reproduce each steps that led to this point. And so uh, to help us with that, uh, we, are use, uh, we use uh, a new tool and would like to introduce you to MLflow. So we leverage MLflow, uh, which is an open source software. And the goal of uh, this software project is to uh, have a kind of platform not limited to few framework uh, or also company infrastructure. And these tools uh, is really useful for us in, uh, in two areas. So first, it allows to log the metrics, the parameter, and also the output, parameter, uh, output model that uh, we train. And this is with the, the tracking uh, module uh, from MLflow. And also, uh, we are able to see the different uh, we can have an overview of all the model that we are currently using in production. And so for that, they have the model registry uh, uh, concepts uh, with MLflow. And so with this, we are able to make it reproducible because we, with that, we have the code version that we, uh, that we are using for our training because uh, with the Git hash, we can log them uh, in MLflow. We have the data that we, that we store and we log the path to make sure that we know where it's coming from. We have the executable, which is the do uh, Docker image that we also uh, is, part, is logged with MLflow. And finally, we have all the logs that are linked to the MLflow and uh, also pushed uh, to our, in a nice UI. And I will show you how it looks like on the, on the UI. So for the tracking, so all the experiments, this is an example of uh, an experiment. So a set of runs that we have, that you can have. And so here you have, in one dashboard, uh, all the runs that you did, and you can see the different parameter that were used, the different metrics, um, and you can also order them by parameters, filters, etc. And you see uh, when it was started, uh, what were, who was the user, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, and the second one is about the MLflow model registry. So this is a dashboard where we see all the model that we have in production. And also you have a, a stage for each of them. So we know if they are in staging, production or archived. And uh, by also 
digging into that, we can see like the different version from when to when they were in which stage, uh, who changed them from stages, and also go back to the to the to the training and uh, see the, the the metrics that were used, the parameters, uh, and the logs. Okay. And just to give you a small example, like how it looks in the code, uh, it's actually fairly simple. So you just import MLflow and then you can just, let me put the pointer, uh, you just with MLflow start run. And if you want to log a parameters, you just log a parameter. If you want to log a metrics, et cetera. And once you have a model that you have, uh, that you want to fit, then you can log the model by saying with a model uh, where you want to have it, uh, saved and if you want to register a model to have it in the model registry you just say how you want to have it there so a very very interesting tool um, yes so we'll talk now about the second part of the puzzle so we see reproducibility as key for a platform uh, but to have it and also being able to deploy to production reliably we have to increase the amount of automation we have on our systems and a concept that summarizes this automation concern is MLOps, uh, which was originally de derived as a derivation of DevOps, which were a, a practice of to summarizes machine learning operations, uh, more specific to machine learning rather than uh, DevOps. And uh, but a central tenet of this ops movement uh, is that every change we make in our code base. Uh, in the master branch is ready to go to production. It's like a production valid change. Uh, that improves a lot uh, the software engineering practice and we believe that it can improve also our machine learning practices. So uh, not only every change should be able to go to production, it should go to production automatically, which uh, uh, requires, and to do that, it requires some automation in place. Uh, not to start from zero with the GitHub repository. Uh, to solve that problem, we came up with a solution of a template that I will explain you next. So in Get Your Guide, we have an internal tooling that is used to uh, speed up the development processes. Like if you want to set up a service or so on, you can use this tool. And uh, uh, it basically contains uh, a templating on steroids uh, functionality, which allowed us to create our own uh, machine learning service template. Uh, and this uh, template then it does, it sets up a skeleton for machine learning uh, projects, but uh, also creates the GitHub repository, creates the AWS infrastructure necessary to run this model and uh, integrates with MLflow. Uh, and it also adds CI/CD. So uh, CI/CD is basically the practice that allows us to go to production automatically uh, while making our, uh, our systems, making sure that our systems are working. I will explain you then in the next slide. It's in details. All right. Yeah. So uh, that's it. Every change we do in our uh, GitHub repo that contains a model will then pass using our CICD pipeline. It will pass through a series of checks. And if all these checks are uh, positive, they will end up in production, basically. So uh, our first series of checks are unit tests. We set up some by default, but uh, the data scientist then uh, has it's desirable that he continues building new tests and uh, we do also uh, style checks, type system checks with MyPy and uh, security checks to see, for instance, if you are using an outdated version of a dependency. And once all of those checks are done, we trigger automatic training that uh, if also succeeds, we then go do automatic deployment. Uh, in the next step, we have a visualization of this process. So I will start with a notebook, the data scientists uh, do the exploration and we reach a point where we say, hey, this goes, this is a, a serious project, let's leave it, move it to production. So 
at that point, uh, the data scientist basically bootstraps a new service. It creates all the infrastructure and at every change, we trigger an automatic deploy that uh, if succeeds, uh, trains uh, our model and saves it into MLflow. And from MLflow, then we are ready to distribute to many other sources. MLflow makes it, uh, is the, the MLflow registry is the place where our model resides and can go to production. Uh, yeah. So, so, so to conclude, uh, so as we grew uh, our data science teams, we need to refine our, our process and uh, to make it more sophisticated. So to do that, we integrated good, soft, uh, good software engineering practices, and we also added some twist to be able to adapt to machine learning, uh, especially with MLflow and this automatic training. And with that, uh, we can help our data scientists to first build faster by focusing on the model and the data and not on the infrastructure and setting things up. So instead of needed one or two, a few days to be able to uh, to start a new project, then uh, in 10 minutes, you you have it ready and set up. Uh, we, are, we are able to deploy safer with automated tests and the CI uh, every time. And also we have autom automatic documentation uh, of the experiments that we are doing uh, thanks to MLflow. Uh, and regarding the next steps for the platform, uh, right now the teams are in the process of porting the projects we have to the template. Uh, and at the same time, we are looking into real-time predictions. And uh, that's, that's a feature desirable for uh, real-time personalization. So we want to really react for the latest interactions of the customers in the website. And the platform is just uh, yeah, the right place to uh, iterate on that concept. We are also uh, we are ready for see the need of a feature store. So uh, as our mo we add more and more models, we want to, to reuse the features that are, they are composed of. And uh, so we need a place to set them all and be able to retrieve them. And uh, yeah, we are continuously uh, looking into monitoring in our systems. Uh, it's very easy for the models to drift in production. And uh, yeah, that's something we will be continuously investing on. Uh, yeah, the last slide, uh, it, this basically completes our presentation. Uh, if this kind of work also sounds interesting to you, uh, you must not, I, we are hiring and uh, the link is just in this slide. You can uh, access it. And now we are open to go through the questions. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so one of the questions that was asked by Magdalena was, uh, are you running MLflow on Databricks? With a smiley yes. face? Yes. Yeah. And then... So uh, yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say maybe for the people who do not know, uh, Databricks is kind of a data platform provider, and which also provide a way to have a centralized notebook, which run on cluster and be able to uh, use Spark. And, uh, and also, uh, they also propose uh, manage MLflow. Yeah. Uh, a small remark by Abdul. Uh, would be nice to have a whole workflow summary uh, from hypothesis idea to fully automated in production. Um, is that a possibility or? Actually, yeah, we have, a, a, we wrote a blog post, uh, which we should go live in the next uh, month. So and we will uh, go through exactly this whole process of uh, uh, going from hypothesis to ID and then uh, going to production with that. Yeah, that's really answer our question. Um, another question by uh, Dimitros. I'm not exactly sure what he's referring to, but why have you made your own? Uh, there are AWS, SageMaker, and Azure ML. I mean, you do use 
you know, flow in some sense. So. Yeah, we, we are picking the pieces from many open source projects. Uh, and actually, uh, we have to already uh, take into account our, our, our legacy or the way that we do things. Databricks is at the core of our operation. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also it's just a natural uh, follow up from that. And we still can leverage SageMaker to go to production. That's actually one of the tools for our real time inference. That we are analyzing but uh yeah so we are for sure not inventing everything at home okay yeah. so we yeah sure Continue. yeah we we do not try to reinvent the wheel and actually we are not building our own we are more assembling our own so we are taking the parts of the yeah. different things so so another question by abdul um what do you mean by automatic training auto ml or why not use some ML ops framework? But then you just basically mentioned, I think, uh, your ML ops, right? Um, um, I think the question um, basically answered itself. Or do you want to comment on this? So we are not using auto ML, but what we made by automatic training is when you have, uh, when you push something into the GitHub repository, it will automatically uh, run the test and if the test pass and uh, you are also pushing to master so we don't want to uh, so when we want to have a new basically model by pushing a new feature to master then it will automatically that's what i mean automatically it will start trigger a training on the whole data set okay. so a very elaborate chrome job no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding um so another uh, question um uh, are you using something like cookie cutter uh, for templating? Probably that wouldn't be enough for the thing you achieve. Or... Yeah. Uh, so cookie cutter is a really good example. Uh, so we are not using cookie cutter. We are using Jinja uh, behind the scene, which is kind of the same the same uh, mm -hmm. thing. But uh, why we have what we have with GigDev actually is uh, more than that because it's also basically already setting up the infrastructure. So we are connecting with MLflow, we are connecting with the Databricks, we have the secrets managed, we create the ECR. So all this thing is already pushed together uh, directly. So you don't have to do this, you just have to run Geek Dev Bootstrap. Okay. So yes, exactly. Cookie cutter alone will not be enough. So uh, I don't see any more questions and I don't have any questions either. Um, and I didn't see any questions on YouTube. YouTube was sort of quiet this time. Oh, there is another uh, question. Uh, can you speak a bit about any challenges you have faced with understanding utilization of the deployed models and how you've addressed them? I'm not, do, do, you, do you understand what, what is meant? I think the challenges in understanding the utilization of deployment, right? So not sure, not sure I'm not sure either. Can you, um, can you, can you Brent? rephrase, Brent? Um, yeah. Oh, uh, hmm? yes. <laughs> well, one thing to say is uh, one big challenge is to have the right data in place. So uh, uh, we are also like at this point, uh, putting uh, on hold all our uh, iterations on some specific models of recommendations because we still don't have the data to see if our changes are uh, being uh, affecting our, our pipeline in a correct way. So uh, the teams and the teams that own the, the, these events and it, sending this data around, are distributed so there are many social challenges around uh, just uh, monitoring your your model and see if that's working in the right direction i'm not sure if that is actually answer your question uh, maybe you have another take on it mm. Theo. yeah I should, so if you've seen zombie model uh, accumulating over time uh, so actually we have the we we have like a quite event driven so we know the number of requests that have been sent and so each time we have a new request so we know we are able to to measure how requested our service our models are uh, so they are not getting zombies uh, definitely they are heavily used um, 
but uh, what is sometimes challenging is uh, moving from one model to the next with a new API or thing like that, because getting all the consumer of our models to adapt to the new model, which might need new parameters or thing like that, is what is uh, challenging because each team has its own priorities and things like that. But that's, uh, yeah, it's not specific to ML. Any kind of uh, microservice architecture kind of have these uh, challenges, I believe. Okay, there are a bunch of new questions. Uh, Theo, do you see them? Yeah. Uh, so Abdul, what framework monitoring do you use for A-B testing? Uh, so not us, but uh, get your guy build its own uh, framework for A-B testing, um, where we are basically able to flip the coins uh, to be able to test uh, new features and is used heavily by, uh, by a lot of teams actually, from design to machine learning, uh, to also backends. Um, and for the monitoring, uh, maybe Jean, you can answer that better. I wasn't sure if it's monitoring for AP testing specific or monitoring in general, but our tool for Keeper team, or uh, yeah, keep an eye on our systems is Datatalk, the main one. There's a lot of, there's other tools like for monitoring or how your events behave, uh, but uh, Datatalk is the, more, the biggest one. Um, question from Ron, is there any concept of ownership of particle? Uh, uh, sorry, is the concept of ownership of particular models uh, in your platform extending on creating? Uh, so yes, the model are owned by teams basically, and they are responsible to um, to keep them running and keep them healthy basically. Um, and they are mission teams. Uh, like for instance, our team is recommendations and relevance. There's another team taking care of our uh ads and uh, so they're kind of clustered around domains and uh, yeah the team on them basically any other questions okay thank you brand uh, I will stop sharing. Um, I will stop uh, recording. And so now what I propose is to try this uh, wonder. So this uh, thing that I talked during the, the interview. So should maybe also stop YouTube. Yeah, I will. I just want to say to YouTube. So, if you want to join uh, the Wonder, you can also by going to uh, Meetup Pi Data Berlin, looking in the comments of the February meetings, and you will be able to find the link to Wonder. And hope to see you there. <laughs>